Okay, guys and girls, welcome back. So, yeah, just turn it off. Thanks. That's why I wrote record on the board. <laughs> okay, so besides using propensities and uh, and a few rules for what they in this paper they call formers and breakers, so residues that are typically found at the start of the helix are formers, and residues that are typically found at the end of the helix are breakers. Uh, and you have similar things for bad sheets, although it's not that strong there. Um, what other things can we use that they aren't using yet <coughs> to predict secondary structure? No? Did you think about it here in coffee? Uh, I'll go through a few then. Right? Okay. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this method. Uh, only to say that it works with the window, so you, you, t you initially take a four residue window and then you go find uh, a segment that scores high for one secondary structure type for all the window positions, and then you keep extending it as long as you get uh, the re residues with a high position. <coughs> very simple, very sensible way of doing it. And it's, it's actually, in a way, surprising that it, it doesn't work well. That is to say, it has a success rate, uh, an accuracy of the prediction about about 50 percent. And uh, that's so. If you have three choices, then your random what's your random chance of having when you have three options? That is that is correct. It's also incorrect because it depends on something. It depends on the odds of the three options. If one of them is much more likely, say one of the three options is 50%, then you can just always choose that one, and you have 50% accuracy. Yeah? If they're all equally likely, then, then it's one third. Then you, your, your random prediction is with 30%. Um, so we're doing three-state prediction here, he, uh, helix, strand, or coil. Uh, but you remember the percentage of coil according to DSSP? <coughs> according to DSSP, how much percent of, of proteins on average is, is coil? 50%, right? So if, if, if I can make an equivalent method, or I can make a much simpler method than they, they did, which is predict everything as coil, it's really useless. But it also scores 50%. Right? So to be able to say whether this is actually uh, good or... Uh, it, I know it's better than that for helices, right? So but you would actually have to look at um, at the uh, more detail for the prediction of helix strand and coil to say whether this is actually any good. Uh, if we don't run a, out of time at the end, I, I'll have some slides on uh, on some measures with how to do that. Um, okay, so um, the the basic idea. Oh, that was right. According to this, it's be a 50% Okay, so, uh, but, but even if you take, let's say, one third as the baseline, then 50%, it's, eh, it's better than random. You would like to be a bit better than that, right? And it seems that 50% is on the low side. <coughs> I think you can agree with that. Um, you wouldn't be happy if that was your score for a multiple choice exam, for example. Right? Uh, even, and even if that's four option multiple choice, then 50 percent. Yeah. It's it, it probably it's probably is it passing? Yeah, probably not even. So you wouldn't be happy with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the basic idea of all these methods is uh, based on on the sliding window. So uh, do you, are you familiar with the idea of sliding window? Yes. Mm -hmm. Who isn't? Good. Yeah. Uh, the, the most important parameter is the window size uh, that, that depend that basically <coughs> determines the, the width of the amount of information or let's say the, the local sequence neighborhood 
from which you use information to make your prediction. And you typically take an odd number of uh, uh, window positions because then you have a central one and then you, your prediction is for a central uh, position. Okay. Uh, so this is a window of uh, seven yeah, and then you predict your uh, um, One of the big issues with window based position, predictions is that each window is independent. So we're looking at this prediction here and we're, we're, we're predicting the strand here and then you shift it by one position then you get you lose this one you, you get that one as, as additional input and then you might be predicting uh, helix for the next one right and then strand for the third one and then again helix so they're independent and it makes that means you could, you actually want to predict whether there's a helix starting from here and then ending there right that's what you but that's not what you're doing if you're using windows you're predicting one residue at a time you're looking at seven minus six in a row and you say uh, is this going to be a helix or not yeah, so it's a very limited view on the protein so it's good to keep that in mind okay so uh, one of the more advanced methods was called GORE it's already also quite a while ago uh, mid 90s um, and um, they oops sorry they uh, had um, a normal window, you can see it's about what is it, 17 or so, um, and then um, they they just score the it's, it's sort of a profile approach. So they they look at uh, at all the positions where all the window positions where the middle residue is a helix, and then you look at the frequency of the minor assets at all the different window positions. So then you get a sort of a profile of that. And then you do sort of a profile scoring for for your new sequence based on what you already have seen. And you will see what, what, whether the profile that you the, the minor assets that you have in your sequence for which you want to predict, whether that's a better match for your helical profile or for your um, better sheet profile. Yeah. Very simple method. Uh, it, it, it's actually a little bit more involved than that, but I don't, don't want to go into all the details. It's just the uh, principle. So you have you have basically three of these patterns: uh, 17 residues long, 20 deep. Yeah. So and then you say, well, if you if you want a helix at this position, then you you have 50% uh, chance of having alanine here, 30% uh, proline, and, and so on. Yeah. So you can get. Uh, and then you do the same, or you actually do three of them, yeah, helix, strand, and coil, so a specific one also for coil. And then you just score its position, and you say, well, the highest one wins. Yeah? And then you, then, then you still have the problem that you might be predicting helix, strand, strand, helix, helix, strand, strand, helix, strand, helix, coil, coil, helix, coil, helix, coil. And you, you know that the helix can be one residue, and the strand also can be one residue, so you still have to do some filtering after it. Okay, um, let me see. I want a different view here. Uh, the Open Office has a funny thing. I can have my all my slides here, but it doesn't scroll. If I, if I once I go through the slides, this one I have to scroll this manually. Um, and uh, you actually get so this is uh, an example of how you get your predictions for a particular input sequence. Um, uh, this, is, this is then the assignments. Uh, so the red is helix, uh, yellow is coil, and blue is uh, better sheet. And here you see the actual scores for each of the three profiles. Right? So then you see uh, helix going up and the other two going down. But you can also have positions where they're sort of in the middle. Yeah? And then, then they're, all, they're all sort of in the middle. So then from that you can also derive something like uh, a confidence score. If, if one of the three is really much higher than the others, then you can confidently say that this is going to be a helix. It could still be wrong, but then you're confidently wrong. Um, and then um, uh, here you, you know that you're a bit less certain, or even here, because it could be a helix, but the others score also quite high. So then you could be less confident, and then you could still be right or wrong. 
Um, but just to just to make sure that you understand that being more confident about a prediction doesn't necessarily mean that you're a more that you have a higher chance of being right. You hope that that's true. <coughs> you can actually, actually test that to be able to say that. Okay. Um, so now um, I want to dive a little bit more into the into the um, to the windows. So Borg actually takes pretty large windows, 17 residues for all of them. Um, if you want to sort of narrow that down, what would you would you actually do you need to take the same length window for each of the different types of secondary structure that you're predicting? Coils are rarely 17 units at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. so but neither are beta struts. Yeah. And also, of helixes, helixes, by the way, they, they can be. So would, what is on average longer? Uh, strand, coil, or uh, helix? What, what is what is sort of what is a restriction for the length, given length of the secondary structure, the length in residues, right? Counting residues on the chain. What is the restriction for the length of the secondary structure on it? Size of the protein. Size of the protein. Yeah? You, can't, you can you can think of a very long helix. Well, a, a helix by itself could be. So you, know, you have some proteins that are just long helices. Yeah, exactly. But but besides that, typically uh, a helix is part of more or less globular uh, bit of protein, and and then it stops when. I mean, that's it's the definition of the protein, right? If you make the helix longer, then you have a bigger protein. Um, so then, if you if you take a Let's imagine a fixed size protein, let's say 3 nanometers uh, diameter, which is a fairly large protein actually already. Um, how many, which one lets you pack more residues along this, the length of the protein, so the diameter of the protein? I would think the helix. Well, I think we agree, right? Because if I take a given length of helix, Right? Let's say this is this, this is three nanometers. It isn't. It's actually uh, more like ten centimeters. But uh, if this is my amount of coil for a uh, or backbone for a helix, and I make uh, a strand out of it, it's much longer. Right? So on average, you expect uh, in terms of in the number of residues, strands to be much shorter than pieces. Um. And if you think of it as dimensions, then alpha helices are kind of like one dimensional because it's just a length, yes. right? While beta sheets, they can loop around in two dimensions. Yeah, but, but the loop isn't hydrogen bonded. So it's, it's it's part of the beta sheet, but now we're talking about the length of the strand. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. because I thought. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so if, yeah, yeah. if you do this, right, then then you can pack even more. Yeah. Uh, but but this is what it is. Four strands or five. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, one sheet with five strands. So I would call these, this may be five residues. Yeah? Okay. So, um, and actually, if you, you can do this, you can do statistics over this. Uh, um, this is quite an old picture, but it really doesn't change much if you take it, would take, would, would redo it now. Uh, maybe the tail, some of the tails go a bit longer. Uh, so the green is the helix, and the red, I hope it's green. It's green? I'm not good with colors. Mm -hmm. And the red is, uh, is beta strand. And you see that, uh, so beta strands peak at around four to five, and the peak is really, it's really going down sharply. So red, you see rarely red, uh, red sheets uh, longer than eight. Yeah. Most of them are, are up to six. Uh, but for helices, they start at five, which is not surprising, because how many how many hydrogen bonds do you have if you have a four residue uh, helix? One. That doesn't really make a stable uh, helix, right? So, but if you then have four, five residues, then you make two hydrogen bonds. Yeah. Uh, so, and then uh, so then they it can go, and it's quite flat actually. From five all the way up to fourteen, I would say it's more or less flat. Yeah. 
Um, and then it can be even a bit longer, and it can be very long. Yeah, but that's because some residue, some proteins are. You have these. Uh, you've seen leucine zippers, maybe. There's a couple of figures in the book. Uh, uh, they actually, they're, they're really like tweezers if you have like a um, uh, uh, DNA. Yeah, so the, the leucine zipper actually does some, it's actually more like this. It, it actually binds in both sides of the helix into the, into the major groove. Uh, but it, the protein is just two helices. It's usually a dimer of two, two helices. So that's, that's where ma many of these long helices come from. Okay. Um, so then it makes sense to take a little bit longer uh, window for helices and a little bit shorter uh, window for stress. So you want to have as much information as you need to do good predictions. So it does make sense to take into account more information if it, it doesn't really give you more, more uh, predictive power. Um, okay, now, um, something more about patterns, but we've covered this at the start already. Um, and uh, are we able, so if you look at two helices and they're next to each other, right? Not like this. Then you expect to have hydrophobic residues on this side and hydrophilic ones on that side, right? So if there's a bit more protein here, then, then everything on this side will be hydrophilic and everything on this side will be hydrophobic. How would that look in the sequence? If, if you have a helix and, and, and this half is protein, this half is water, how, how does that look if you look in the sequence of this helix? So residue one is over here, right? It's, it's sort of on the border, so it could be hydrophobic kind of thing. Then we have uh, two over here that will be hydrophobic. Yeah? Should be. Right? Then three is probably hydrophilic, four is hydrophilic, five is hydrophobic, six is hydrophobic, seven is hydrophilic, eight is probably hydrophilic. Yeah? So two hydrophobic, two hydrophilic. Give or take. Yeah? So what is what is the uh, amount of residues along one third of the helix? It, it's not quite four because the the fourth one has to make a hydrogen bond already with the first residue. Three point six. Yeah? You already said it. So it, it's it's a little bit less than than a, a four fold period uh, in a regular helix. Most helices aren't that regular actually. But too hydrophobic, too hydrophilic, give or take. Would you expect to always see this pattern if you look at an individual sequence of a helix that's packed in the protein like this? Most helices actually are on the surface of a protein. Yeah? So typ typically, well, there's, there's many ex uh, exceptions to this, but typically the interior of a protein is better sheet and the exterior is sort of coated with helices. So most helices are actually uh, stuck to the side of the protein, which means they need a hydrophobic side to be on the inside. But if they wouldn't have that hydrophobic side, what would they do? They would not, they would dissociate from the protein, right? They would not, they would not stick. So they have a hydrophobic side and a hydrophilic side. If you look at an individual protein sequence like that, here sequence, would you expect to see this strict pattern hydrophobic, hydrophobic, hydrophobic? Sure. Does it have to be that strict? <coughs> or put it differently, how many hydrophobic residues do you expect to find in the surface of the protein? Is the surface of the protein going to be only hydrophilic residues? I see most people not doing anything, but if I see some people shaking their heads. Right? So the consensus seems to be no. It doesn't have to be, it has to be enough hydrophilic residues for the protein to be soluble. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be completely hydrophilic. That one big reason why proteins typically aren't completely hydrophilic is that the protein never works alone. 
And to be able to work with anything else, it needs to bind. To be able to bind, it needs to be at least a little bit hydrophobic, usually. Yeah, so two proteins need to meet and, and bind for a little while. They need a small hydrophobic patch to bind. Yeah? If a protein needs to attach to the membrane, it needs some hydrophobic uh, patch. If it needs to bind to some other molecule, yeah, it, there has to be some hydrophobicity in there, because otherwise it won't bind. Okay. Same as on the inside. You can have polar uh, residues on the inside. Not too many. It's fine. As long as you do what? Yes, because a polar residue always makes hydrogen bonds. Otherwise, it's not polar. Yeah, so if you satisfy the hydrogen bonds, there's no, nothing wrong with having polar parts in the interior of the protein, because the backbone does it all the time. Yeah, as long as you make these hydrogen bonds, it's fine. So if you have this two, two, hydrophobic, two hydrophilic base pattern, if you look at any particular sequence, you might not always see it. So how can you make this pattern more obvious? Very simple trick that's used, being used in biomedics all the time. You've used it. You've had lectures on it. How do you make this pattern? Where, where does this pattern... Hmm, I'd say that. <coughs> where would you expect this pattern to, to be important? in terms of maybe evolution. If the protein function is important and the structure is important for the function, and this helix is important for the structure, right? If you don't maintain this pattern of hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, overall, then you're losing the structure of this, the function of this protein. What happens if you lose the function of this protein and the function is important for the survival of the cell? It doesn't survive. Yeah? Okay. So how now can you find more information about the pattern of this, this hydrophobicity pattern of this particular sequence that we're interested in? No ideas? How do we typically amplify patterns in bioinformatics about sequences? Where the, the pattern in the individual sequence might be very weak. Conserve sequences, but then they are all have the same amino acids. Okay, you're, you're sort of sort of in the right direction. Okay, so you look for homologues, and then you look for the conservation. Right? I think that's maybe what you find. Yeah. So, but how do we call that? If we if we make make an alignment of a number of sequences, and then what do we call that? Usually, or immediately in bioinformatics. Sorry, I heard I heard different things. I'm, Hmm? No? Profile. Yes. You look at profiles. Yeah? So then you're looking at a profile, and you want to actually see uh, one position where most of the residues are in your, in your profile are hydrophobic. The next one, most of them are hydrophobic. The next residue, most of them are hydrophilic. Not necessarily all of them. Yeah? Okay. So now we found one way to make your sequence, uh, secondary structure uh, from sequence prediction better is don't use an individual input sequence, but use a profile. Because then you can look at the conservation patterns, and they're much stronger than the, the, the patterns in an individual um, sequence. All the current uh, top-ranking secondary structure prediction methods, they all use uh, uh, profiles as an input. Sometimes just uh, plain old PSSM profiles that BLAST, like the ones that BLAST uh, produces, not necessarily produced with BLAST, but the same principle. Um, but often also HMMs, because then you also have uh, the transition uh, uh, probabilities. So you can look at correlation of uh, neighboring residues, and you can actually encode gaps, which is also very important. So why would gaps, information about gaps be important when you're uh, predicting secondary structure elements? Where do you find? Yeah, so if you see bits with lots of gaps, then you're saying, okay, this is most likely going to be a core. Yeah? Not necessarily always. But yeah. Okay, so we're getting there. So this is actually the pattern that you, you expect for helix. Uh, I don't want to go through the details of the, of the strands, uh, but if you have a better sheet, 
then one C alpha, if this is the one, one strand and the next strand is behind it and the next strand is behind it, yeah, then the first residue, if it sticks up, C alpha uh, and the, the side chain sticks up, then the next residue will be sticking down. And this one is sticking up again, this one is sticking down. Yeah? So that means that if, the, if this is the surface of the protein, Uh, and then this is below, this is inside, <coughs> yeah? that means this residue is hydrophilic, this one is hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, yeah? Most residues, as I already said, most beta sheets are actually inside the protein, but then it's very simple, there's a bird strand, they're all hydrophobic in the middle, and only the, the ones at the ends, few at the end, are hydrophilic. Because they'll, they'll be not really covered with the rest of the protein, so they'll, they'll be hydrophilic. And then you have the X strand, which might be the last strand, which may be on the outside of the protein. It could be covered with something else, then it's a buried strand. But if it's not, then the residues aren't sticking out straight. They're sticking out at an angle, either this way or that way, or this way or that way. So it means if this one is sticking in, the other one is sticking out, and if this is the edge of the protein and I'm hydrophobic, then if this one is going to be hydrophobic, the next one is going to be hydrophilic, because if this one is sticking into the protein, the next one is sticking out. So this is the plane of the sheet. Yeah, I'm hydrophobic. You're the water. And yeah. And then, uh, and then, so if this one is sticking like this, then the next one is sticking like that. Okay. So then you get alternating. Also, get an alternating hydrophobic hydrophilic pattern uh, for what's called the edge strands. Good. Now. Loops also are typically hydrophilic uh, because they're on the outside, uh, but you can also have, uh, have coil regions that are not loop because they're on the inside, and they will be hydrophobic. Okay, so they will be difficult to distinguish from a buried strand <coughs> um, just by looking at hydrophobicity alone. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah. <coughs> so. Um, <coughs> So the Gore method was, let's say, early 90s. Uh, what, uh, what people started doing then was doing uh, conservation patterns, multiple alignment, uh, smarter algorithms. HMMs are both algorithm and a way to encode uh, your profile. Uh, also, the, data, the databases were, they were already growing, but they started growing more rapidly. They're still growing. Uh, but that's good because the, better, the bigger the database is, the better we can uh, get input for our profiles. Um, so now, the other thing that we can do is to think of secondary structure uh, prediction as a uh, as a general or as a specific case of uh, the classification problem. Um, as I already said, uh, these windows-based methods. They, they take a very strange view of a protein because they just basically just they cut the protein up into a peptide and they say, okay, well, if I have this peptide, what is this central, <coughs> central residue going to do? That's not how protein structure is formed. The more sensible way is to look at it as a classification problem where you can say, okay, well, this is actually the way I phrase it here now. It's more like a segmentation problem. Okay, so this part of the sequence is going to be a helix. Uh, this part is going to be the better sheet, and the other two parts are going to be uh, coil. Okay, so um, then if we have, so you can either look at it as, as uh, a segmentation problem or a classification problem, which is like the window based approach, but then you can just use any kind of machine learning method that, uh, that uh, applies to that kind of problems uh, and, uh, and, and start training and predicting. So that's what uh, people have been doing uh, basically ever since the late 90s uh, with increasing uh, success. And that's only partly due to the methodology, it's mostly due to the databases. More databases, more se sequences uh, to train on, more structures to test on. <coughs> um, just to, so there's actually two uh, things you can still do if you're, so, uh, to be clear what we're talking about, so classification is if you have uh, a number of samples with input features and you're assigning labels, helix, strand, coil. Right? That's classification. 
This is what we typically do for secondary structure, uh, where we have these three cases. Uh, a related problem, but it's different, is regression, where your input could be completely the same data, but your output is not labeled. Oh, it says labels here on the, on the axis, but this should be values. So you want to predict a, a given value and say, okay, this is 1, this is 0.3, so this is more quantitative. And this could be, for example, when you're predicting solvent accessibility. So you're not predicting this residue is going to be exposed or buried, but you're predicting, okay, this residue is going to be uh, so much percent of its surface is going to be exposed to the solvent, or maybe uh, not as a percentage, but as an absolute value in square angstroms, this amount of surface area. Uh, it could also be, because that's what, what later methods uh, are starting to do, in, ad in addition to uh, predicting the secondary structure class, they're actually <coughs> predicting the backbone angles. So they're predicting the most likely value of the phi and the psi angle uh, in addition to the alpha index. Which is nice because if, and that's a big if, because we can't do it, but if you could do it very accurately, if you know all the phi and psi angles along the backbone accurately enough, you can basically reconstruct the whole uh, structure of your uh, uh, of your of your uh, protein. Because if you if you know how to start and where to put the next bit, then uh, if you get all the fine triangles right, then you then you get uh, the helix, right? And then you can get the next bit of your uh, protein right. But any small error that you make will will accumulate because if you if you get the angle slightly too wide then you don't get a helix, but you get something like a uh, spaghetti shape. Right? OK, uh, so we're talking about classification here, typically. And then we can look at uh, uh, some very simple method is k-nearest neighbors. Have you, have you heard about k-nearest neighbor methods before? You're, some of you are doing machine learning course right now, right? Who is not doing the machine learning course right now? OK, that's still enough. Uh, so okay, I'll, I'll go through okay, neighbor, neighbor in a minute. Uh, you can use in the Markov models. Most of you have seen those uh, in, in the algorithm sequence analysis. Who has not seen the Markov models up close yet? Don't, don't be afraid. I mean, it's, it's also still enough people. Uh, five minutes for KNM. Five minutes for HMS. Uh, neural networks. Who has not seen neural networks up close? People. Okay. Five minutes for neural network, and then deep, deep neural net. So two minutes to wrap up, and then we have six minutes to go to the to the third. One. Okay, that should work. Okay. So this is sort of uh, also a sort of historical succession of different methods that have been used. The Kenner's neighbors method is is actually conceptually very very elegant. Uh, it doesn't work, but it's conceptually very elegant. <coughs> so what you do basically, you look at your input window. Uh, whatever many residues you want, maybe we take the 17 residue window that Gore used. Uh, then you look up this, basically you do a blast of this, uh, you don't use blast because uh, you need slightly different sensitivity there. But uh, for this window in your database, you look for k, which could be a number between let's say 10 and 50, um, the, the, let's say the 50 best, best hits in your database of, of, from your sequence, your input sequence. And then for those 50, uh, you look up what is the secondary structure of this middle position of my window. And they say, okay, I see one with a helix, one with a coil, another helix, another helix, there's one strand and another helix. Ah, four out of six say helix. Okay, so quite likely this position should be a helix. Then. Uh, so then you say helix, and then you, you, you go to the next window position, and you have one residue, new residue at the end, and you lose one residue at the start. You do it again, and then you get prediction for the, for the next one. Why does this not work? What do we not use? We've just discussed all the things that we should use to get good predictions. What do we not use if we do this? It's related to the question that you just asked after the coffee break. Because you, you said, so if you do homology modeling, right, you, you want to choose a template. Uh, even if you have very close hits, 
So close homologs, good hits. You could even have, you could have many of them. Let's say you have 50 hits with a structure that are all, let's say, between 40 and 60 percent identical to your um, your your query sequence. Yes. Which one is the best template? The one with the lowest sequence or the highest sequence identity to your query? Possibly. But what would you really want to have? Hmm? Yeah, so that's that's the trick that you use. But you, you really want the one, but the structure is most similar to that of your input sequence. <coughs> but you don't know the structure, right? So you could use secondary structure prediction on your input query and then compare it to the predictions on your on your um, uh, on each of your templates. But you can also make profiles of each of them and look at the conservation patterns in the profile from your queries and all the, uh, the hits that you found and the one where all the conserved positions match the best those are the ones that have, are the most likely to have the same structure yes, you're working? and that could be hit number 10 if you sort it by sequence identity could be the one that where the conserved positions have the best hit, best match. Right? So you could have, you can have uh, sequences that, by chance, have more similar amino acids uh, with your query, but they're not in the right structure. And the only way to see something about the structure is to look at the conservation, because the conservation pattern tells you something about what has been <coughs> conserved, what has been important for survival of this protein, probably linked indirectly to the structure. Yeah? So the conservation pattern is the next best thing that you have if you want to say something about the structure. Yeah? Now, how are we using that here? What are we comparing? We're just comparing sequences, right? So we, we, we're we're doing exactly the same as when you when you select your. Uh, I've now got you all confused about your assignment, and you're thinking like, "Oh crap! I chose the wrong or the wrong template to do my homology model." Don't worry. Yeah, you can write this down. The, the deadline isn't isn't fast yet, is it? Yeah, yeah. So you can you can just write in your report that you could have done it differently. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> I, because I saw some people thinking much harder than the, than the question was worth. Okay, yeah, so uh, so here you're doing exactly the same thing as what you do when you just pick your template based on the percentage identity. Yeah? And that could be a good, could, uh, that could be a good choice, but it doesn't have to be. It depends on your conservation. So you could redo this trick with uh, profiles. I actually don't know if there's any method that has done that. Can use neighborhood profiles. Might work well. I don't know. But it has been tried. Could be worth a literature study. Okay. Uh, so let's get your neighbors. Um, and there's one example. So if you have uh, this particular peptide, you can blast it to see, uh, blast it against the PDB, see what comes up. Um, but this, we did this uh, a while ago. You can find this in uh, in this protein where it's, uh, it's a better strand. Uh, and if you're good with cores, you can, you can see that it starts here, red, and then goes up to it there. I've used this slide long enough, so I know what to call it. Uh, but you find the same, exactly the same peptide, the same amino acids, exactly the same ones, in a helical bit in, in an other protein. Yeah. So that's the, that's the basic problem. Uh, so the... Uh, the amino acids are not the, the thing that's conserved. They're not worth conserving. What's worth conserving is, is the structure, or actually the function. Right? You know function, mm -hmm, then structure, mm -hmm, then sequence, right? Structure is more conserved. Function is more conserved than structure. Structure is more conserved than sequence. OK, this is an example of the uh, way you can do this. You can do the same trick with neural with uh, with your sliding window, and then feed all the uh, things into a neural web net. And one of the oldest methods doing this is called uh, PhD, 
So you have, I'm not going to go into the details of, of neural networks, there's other courses for that, but uh, the, the basic idea is you have an input layer, and then you have uh, one element for each of the positions in your window for the input. Then you have a couple of layers that do basically uh, cross correlations, and then uh, you have uh, a layer that does output. And the, the trick is to give all these edges weights so that the, the, the patterns are, are learned from your, from your trainings. Um, and um, so, and, and, they have, and then all the intermediate layers are called hidden layers. So it, it, it typically looks a bit like this. You take your window, uh, hidden layer, and then you get an output, and you can score 0.7 for the You have different outputs for the different uh, um, uh, structures that you want. Um, and so PZ, there's a whole series of methods uh, that started with PZ, and that's PZ Psi, which you can s already imagine what the difference is. This was using Psi blocks to generate profiles. Uh, ProfSec also uses profiles in a more, more uh, smart way. Uh, this is, a, this is uh, a huge amount of reading, but uh, it just tells you uh, roughly what it is. And uh, the actual method is uh, actually layers of neural nets, <laughs> not just a neural net with layers of neurons, but layers of neural nets. There's a first layer of <coughs> nets, then there's a set of uh, nets in the second layer, and then there's a jury layer at, at, uh, at the last end. It takes all the predictions. So this, are, this basically predicts stuff that's then used in, I, I think there's like 100 uh, neural nets in this layer which takes the predictions from the first layer as input, makes 100 predictions, and then these are filtered by the jury, uh, the third layer, the jury layer, which then gives you the output. And um, still, this one will predict, happily predict, strand, helix, helix, strand, helix, strand. <coughs> and so even after this, uh, you still have to correct for uh, a strange uh, single residue of uh, secondary structures. Okay. Um, we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to go. Oh, I just want to mention this one. I mentioned a lot of these things already that are on the slides. Uh, I don't always stick to the. I, I try to trigger your curiosity and then follow your curiosity instead of my science. Um, one of the things you can do to predict better strands is to realize that for one strand, you need usually one, typically two others. Uh, otherwise, it's not a strand. Um, and so this is SS Pro does, does it explicitly by having three sliding windows. So you take the central one, and then for each position of the central one, you look for a match uh, upstream and downstream, basically, in the broken sequence, uh, to get uh, three strands to make a helix. Uh, sorry, to make, make a sheet. Um, and, and there's actually very weak, but uh, detectable uh, correlations between adjacent strands in a better shape that you can uh, capture this one. Okay, um, hmm. there's other stuff you want to predict, but I'm also going to skip it over. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm not going to go into the things of training. I just want to say something about training sets. So this is a scheme that we came up with while doing. It's actually we're doing different prediction protein inter inter interface positions. But uh, the principle is the same. Uh, one of the problems that we had, so we wanted to train on this data set. Uh, but we were using uh, input generated by two other proteins, two other tools that were trained on their own specific training sets. So now if you want to have a separate uh, test set, uh, you want to avoid similarity, homology, between your test set and uh, any of the proteins in the training set of the other methods, because that would mean you're testing on methods that were very easy to predict for these methods. Yeah? In addition to having a filtering for identity between your, your own test set and your own training set, you also want to uh, uh, filter for, uh, to avoid the um, overlap with, or similarity even, with uh, training sets of other <coughs> sources of information that you use to make your predictions. Okay, so.
So the last thing um, I want to show you is how far we've got with these prediction methods. So this is from a fairly recent review, it was actually last year, where uh, these are some of the most recent methods. Um, and the previous slides that I skipped, they explain what it, how you calculate a Q3 um, um, what's that, the prediction uh, accuracy. Uh, but this explicitly takes into account the non-random base frequencies of your uh, classes, right? So you have three classes, so that's why it's a Q3 prediction. Um, and uh, so you score how often you predict each of these three correctly. So now you can see that so there are two different test sets. There are test set 115. And a test set from CASP, the uh, CASP edition 12, uh, which I think was 2016, I think the most recent one that was available last year. And you see that the accuracies are actually quite impressive. Well, certainly, if you look at the bottom one, so this is a, a deep convolutional uh, neural network or neural field, uh, what else they call it, also used in image recognition and speech recognition. Um, and people are now applying. Can we now have enough data to actually be able to, to uh, train these deep networks? Because the deeper your network, the more parameters you have. So you need a lot of training data to be able to train this successfully. And you get prediction accuracies uh, well, well uh, above 80%. That's really very useful. It means if you, that's fine, right? That, that means that if you're comparing, let's say you're doing your homology, uh, template selection, you have your secondary structure predicted for your query, you can compare it with your... Do you need a secondary structure prediction for your templates? Or do you, can you look it up? What, what does your template sequence have that your query sequence doesn't have <coughs> in homology modeling? Structure, right? Otherwise it's not a template. Yeah? So you don't have to do the prediction for your templates. You can just look it up. And, and then you can just see, okay, you have a helix here, uh, there's a helix there. Yeah. If you miss one out of five residues or one out of five secondary structure elements, it typically will be not a single, or it's, it's typically the edges of the helices that are sort of too long or too short. But also sometimes if there's a short helix, you might miss it. But that's okay, right? The overall structure, of, like if you have <coughs> 10 helices uh, and one short one, you'll be able to see whether you have that same set of secondary structure elements in your template, in the right uh, sort of uh, configuration. So that's that's really good enough to be used. Okay, so uh, th this is the, uh, th this is about the percentage of missed predictions, so between helix and strand, less than 1%, between helix and coil, 10%, strand and coil, 7%, yeah, so I didn't even know which kind of errors you can extract. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's okay. Um, I'm not going to go into that. So the other thing I already mentioned is that the methods are typically starting to predict uh, the uh, backbone uses. So you have uh, phi and psi, and there's also uh, theta and tau which are the angles between the C alpha carbons. That's easier than, that, that sort of a more coarse, in, in, a more coarse way of describing the shape of the chain. So you just jump from one residue to the next one. So you, can, you can do the same, you can do what you do with the four atoms in a row, you can do with four <coughs> C alphas in a row. Yeah, same idea. Okay. Um, and uh, they're not very good, but they're, de they're getting better. And the, the nice thing about uh, particularly deep neural nets, the, the deep learning methods, is the more stuff you let them do at the same time, the better they get, because they have more sort of um, handholds to capture uh, meaningful patterns out of the training data. If you only predict, if you, if you only predict, 
you only need to predict one thing, then it's very easy to capture noise that happens to correlate with the one thing you're trying to predict out of your training set. If you need to predict five different things, or six or ten, then it's getting increasingly less likely to, to get correlations of ten different features with noise. Yeah. So your, your method actually becomes better the harder you make the task, which is maybe a counterintuitive, but that's... So that's why one of the reasons that people are doing this. Um, so to wrap up, so in the 70s, people were happy with 50%. Now we're approaching, uh, well, we're, we're beyond 80%. Um, and uh, I, I, I've given this lecture long enough that I, I started saying that we were approaching 80%. We're now well beyond that. The theoretical limit is thought to be about 87%. I don't remember uh, how they came up to this, but uh, we're getting very close to that. And um, I think I've told you a bit about how we're getting there. Uh, the, next, the next step is to actually make the prediction problem harder by including more things. So I'm actually thinking of starting, uh, uh, where I would like to have one of you guys to do an internship with me where we can do secondary structure prediction together with uh, predicting protein interaction sites. Uh, which was one of the, the, the test set slide that I showed you. is one of the method that I uh, made for just predicting protein interaction sites. And I think if we combine that with secondary structure prediction, solvent accessibility prediction, and maybe even background angle prediction, then uh, we have an interesting uh, target. So if you're interested in something like that, um, you're very welcome to contact me and see if we can make an internship out of that. Okay, with that, I'm done. Sorry for being a little bit tight uh, on time. Are there any questions? If not now, I'll be around during the practical. Yeah, uh, I'm